What's up guys, FSC Speed Shop. Today we're gonna to continue working on Shaka. Now Shaka is the 1983 Datsun 280ZX that is owned by my son. I'm not gonna get into the big history of it, but this car used to be my son's when he lived on Hawaii. We had the car shipped here. Back on the other channel is a whole thing as far as how we got the car here. We always talked about this car as being a drift car. The only thing that we've done to it so far is we put our stickers on it. That way at the track we can start advertising for the channel, or at this point a multitude of channels. Obviously if you've been following me for any length of time, you know about FSC Trucking. There's also FSC Truck Shop, which is working on the trucks here. And then of course what always was the original intention of me being on YouTube, FSC Speed Shop. The channels were always an automotive channel. This is the first of the new FSC Speed Shop. Obviously the original channel still is FSC Trucking. With that being said, now with all you auto enthusiasts here, let's get started with the first video for FSC Speed Shop. So Matt, obviously you've been doing some work here. I mean, that's not how we got the car. No, um, I lifted it up and took the hubs apart and uh, I got them off the car and because of how the, originally we were supposed to just do brakes, but with how this car is designed, you have to take the hub off in order to get the brakes off because the brake rotors are attached to the back of the uh, hub. Now there's two big reasons we wanted to go with a high performance brake kit with this car. First of all is we did plan on putting this car on a track. The first being a drift track that we've been talking about doing with this car since the day we've even thought about bringing the car here. And the second is that the drag strip. Now you don't necessarily need a big set of brakes for the drag strip, but you never know. He might actually want to road course this car too. The other reason is it's a lot heavier. This car has a 350 small block Chevy in it as opposed to the inline six cylinder with the turbocharger, which was in it factory. This is how we got the car. This engine runs reasonably well right now. The lower end was rebuilt before my older son had taken possession of this car. But my older son put a new set of heads on it, iron heads, I don't know why. And then an intake that doesn't match the cam properly. So that's a future issue. But it is a pretty potent engine. Sounds pretty nice. So we're going to leave it there for now. You got to bear in mind, Matt's 17. So how much you want to give him at first, right? So we really don't know what the future of this car is as far as the track goes. But we're definitely going to play with this car, and I felt that the heavier the car, the bigger the brakes you're going to want. Now Matt's going to show you the big difference between what was on there and what we're going to put on. This is one of the calipers that Matt took off the car. Matt, go ahead and get the new one. Will do. And you can tell this one's basically iron. It weighs a lot. And it's a single cylinder caliper with just a real big cylinder in the back. Obviously, we just cut the hose off to take it off. So we got a brand new caliper here. Obviously weighs much, much less. This is a four cylinder caliper, two in the back, two in the front, and it'll go with the big brake kit. Now I did say big brake, so go ahead and show them the other parts. That's the original rotor. That's the new one. Obviously big difference in size. These are obviously also drilled and slotted. These are just bare steel. These seem to weigh more. They're not carbon fiber or anything real super fancy. This is by no means an exotic car. However, it is much larger for better heat dissipation compared to these little things here. Obviously, this won't bolt directly to the car, as one would think, but there is a kit made. We have that kit, and with some minor modifications, it fits just nice. Now, the hub and rotor, as you can see, Matt holding it here, comes apart in two separate pieces. If this were in the trucking world, a lot of guys would call these inboard rotors because to get the rotor off the hub, the hub has to come off the spindle. Go ahead, Matt, and demonstrate. So in order to take the rotor off, it is attached with four bolts on the back of the hub, and then the hub assembly is then put back on to the car. So you have to take the hub assembly fully off and then dismount your rotor in order to put new ones on or replace them. Now what Matt is going to do is he's going to hammer out the old bearing races out of that hub because we are going to replace them with new bearings.
that's it now what Matt's doing is he's installing the new races in the hub with my 1947 vintage 50 ton press obviously he won't need all 50 tons but oh the stories this press could tell yeah no the socket Yeah, I have it in there. Right. Okay. The lever first. Okay. I'll put the socket in there and hold it straight and then pull it down. Throw the valve. There you go. Now pull it down a little bit. That's solid. I was trying to show the pressure valve before Matt released it. He brought it up to about 500 PSI. Got to flip and do the other side. Now this one used that collar off that Ford axle, the original nine inch collar. Okay. Yeah. Nine inch meaning it came out of a nine inch rear. But it makes a good plate to push on a brand new uh, race. Cool. Now you just gotta grease your bearings and put them in and put the seal on. Yep. Mm I'm good. Never mind. Okay. You said hammer on it a little bit? Yep. Just to get it started. Get it down till it's flush. Now I use that collar. Sounds pretty solid to me. Yeah. All right, all right. Now I gotta go answer the phone. Mm, yeah. I wonder if that song is copywritten. <laughs> yeah, right? We found out the hard way on the other one. 
because the rotor is so much larger, that dust cover will get in the way. So you have to remove the dust cover. I'm going to assume this car is factory, and this dust cover is simply held in by these four Phillips head screws, which are not the easiest to get out. The other side I drilled two and removed two. That came out easy. With a click, that came out. That one's not coming out. That one comes out easy. Okay, three, pull three, and drill one. Just drill it out till the head comes off. skip ahead and do this part here which is install the caliper mounting bracket only because it's visible now and easy to see on the other side when we perfected this job we ran into a couple problems and it was harder to see with the rotor already on the car what this bracket here does is the caliper original one bolted to these two holes right here however with the rotor being so big and we're using completely different calipers you have to put another bracket on here now this piece right here is machined down a little bit. See this part here where they got embedded K&E made in USA. But up here is where they have it machined down a little bit. That way the rotor lines up better with the caliper. Or rather with this machine down the caliper lines up with the rotor. Either way this bracket has to be installed. And I'll show you the next problem you're going to run into. The K&E part actually faces out. You're not going to see it facing in because the rotor's right here. So this plate bolts on here with these bolts that go through these holes and into the bracket. Now, if you do not put some kind of spacer, this is the factory bolt that came from Datsun. If you do not put these two flat washers, the bolt will protrude too far and will rub the new rotor. So you have to put the bracket, then the bolt with your spacer washers and thread it on like so. Now we have to put the rotor onto the hub before the hub goes on to the vehicle. It takes four bolts that hold it onto the back. All you gotta do is just tighten them down. When I took it off the car, they did have lock washers, but the lock washers are kind of not in the greatest shape anymore. So we're replacing them with new ones. Let me figure a position so you're not going to pop me in the mouth with that thing if it comes loose. There you go. What he's doing is he's dabbing a little bit of oil on the seal so it doesn't tear when you put it on a car. So we'll put some on the seal surface of the actual seal. And he'll dab some on the car spindle right where the seal meets it. That way it'll get a little wet. The idea is to keep it from burning up or tearing when you put it on. Perfect. Wait, did you grease the inner race? No, I didn't. The outer race? Yep. Just gets, there you go. Yep.
And now I have on camera how you got grease on the rotor. What he's doing now is he's putting a little grease on a washer just to make it a little bit easier to turn the adjustment nut when you're setting your preload. All you're going to do is snug it down. We have to put a tire on it in order to adjust preload. Yep. Okay. Matt, while I have it framed up, go ahead and show them how you know the proper direction of a drilled and slotted rotor. To know the proper position, whether it's a left or right, the slots should be always pointing back to the back of the car. So as it spins, you should always have that point go backwards. This being the front left of the car, that way the slots face to the rear, so you're looking at the front left. There we go, so now you see the positioning. And that's how you tell the direction of a drilled and slotted rotor. Now what Matt is doing is he's putting the original wheel spacer that came with the car on it. Now this car is a four lug car, and these spacers are four lugs. It's about a two inch gap that they're creating between the rotor hub and the wheel. We're not gonna use the original wheels that came with the car. Simply put, they don't fit and the tires are very old and in my opinion, quite unsafe. But for what we're doing right now, it'll work because we're not gonna put the fancy wheel adapters on since we're just doing preload. We're just gonna put what was on there now that way we could feel the bearing play and then take it back apart after assembling of the brakes. Oh, that play is obvious is visible mm -hmm. there you go just give her give her till she's snug and then what you want to do is you want to just keep adjusting that nut until the little too tight i could tell that already what you want to do is you want to keep tightening that nut until the play just goes away do you feel any mm -hmm. all right give it just a, a snug more like a touch Good. Is there enough? Just a little bit. Gone. Well, wow. let me see. Let me verify. I just want to verify just in case we over tighten it. I don't want to cook a bearing on them and then have a disaster later. Yeah, I don't feel any. I'm going to back it up just a touch. You can hear that. Mm -hmm. Shh. Camera might have caught that. Just a smidge. Done. Any play that's in there is in the front end being worn out and loose. So that's where you lock it down. Then take that piece back off and put it back on just so they see. Clay zoomed in hard. Good.
You bend, then cut, or cut, then bend? I bend the out one all the way over and then cut it. Okay. I'll use the tip, go in deeper. Yep. The other way. Yep. And tap that in with a hammer. That's done. Perfect. So these are the Willwood calipers for this car. Like I said, they're very light aluminum. They're four cylinders, so meaning there's two cylinders on the outside part of the caliper and two more cylinders on the inside part of the caliper. They're fed through here. If we remove this, there's a port for your brake fluid to go in. They ride on this particular car like so, or sorry, actually more like this, and you have bleeders on the bottom and the top. Now they don't know a left from a right. It doesn't make a difference because you got bleeders on the tops and on the bottom. They also do say if they're riding on the top like so or down bottom like this, you do have to take the caliper off and hang them one way or the other to bleed them properly. Obviously, air goes up, fluid goes down. The other detail I want to point out is the fluid feeds in from the back, but it also transfers through here to get to the other side. So... That's something to consider. Also, you don't have to put the brake pads in before you put them on. You bolt this on and then slide the pads in and then put your cotter pin through. Now, what you do have to worry about is your position on your rotor in and out. Just like that big brake kit we put on the Chevelle, you have to already shim it or know what you're doing. But with this custom-made aluminum bracket, the work was already done for me. The other side lined up perfectly. However, we did run into a very significant problem, but we found a very simple fix for it. Matt, go ahead and put the caliper on, and then we'll get into the problem. Will do. All right, so we have our caliper and the bolts that are provided with the bracket and the calipers for them to then bolt together. Go through the caliper into that aluminum bracket. Top one's in, and I take my bottom one. I'll get the hole, line it up, and twist it in. And now the caliper is now seated to the bracket. All I have to do is tighten with the ratchet. And Spin your rotor to verify nothing's rubbing. Perfect. Now, as I spoke earlier, you have to make sure your caliper is centered to your rotor. So here's your rotor center, there's your caliper center. You don't want it hefted one way too far or hefted the other way too far. Again, that's what that machine surface was on that aluminum block for mounting. They already did the homework for us. However, there is one significant problem. Your brake pads are supposed to slide in like here, one there, and the other here. They don't. The pistons are fully retracted into the caliper. So what's the problem? Well, let me explain. This is gonna get a little complicated, but not too much. Okay, allow me to get my professor glasses on. So what we have here is, now right, Okay, so here's the way it works, okay? This is stupid. 
That's the end I'll take. So this caliper right here is the part number on the bottom. I already did this research yesterday. Now I wanted to verify a few things with the manufacturer that sold me this kit. Now Willwood is the manufacturer of the parts, but they're not the ones that supplied the kit. In other words, they're not the one that did the research to make these calipers, these brake pads, these rotors fit on the Z car behind me. Somebody else did that. Somebody else had paid me no royalty, so we'll mention that if the price is met. This rotor measures 0.884 inches thickness, and in millimeter, I think that was like 22 and change, almost 23 millimeter. The rotor is labeled on the edge of it, minimum thickness 20 millimeter, which comes out to, what's 20 millimeter in inches? 20 millimeter is 0 0.787. According to Will Wood's website, this caliper requires a rotor thickness of 0 0.81, which is not very much bigger than the minimum thickness of the rotor. So either the rotor is too fat or the caliper is too small. However, I checked with the company that sold me the brake kit and they identified each by part number, the rotors by its part number, the caliper by its part number, and the brake pads by their part number. And according to them, the kit is right. They also told me they will fit, but tightly. And yes, they do fit very tight. And he said in about 100 miles, they will grind themselves down, you'll be fine. However, that seems uh, crazy to do, to take a performance brake rotor, performance caliper, pads, the whole bit, knowing they're too tight, and drive them down a road about 100 miles or so, knowing that you're making a tremendous amount of heat. But again, the part numbers were right, it's just that it doesn't seem to work perfect. So what's the answer? Maybe mill the rotor down, but you're milling a rotor down almost to minimum thickness. That seems dumb. Well, what's the other sacrificial part? The brake pad. Well, how do you make the brake pad thinner? And we're not talking a lot. We're only talking less than half a millimeter each side. So, to the palm sander we go. So I gotta come down. Okay, now that we've sanded these pads down to enough to where they could fit in smoothly without giving too much problem, now we can insert them and then we could put the cotter pin in which holds them in the caliper without them falling out. Pause. Now we're going to install the brake hose that goes to it. This is like a stainless braided and it's covered by like a rubberized clear epoxy or something, but it's you don't feel the stainless, you could see it. Either way, it hooks up to the car like so. This piece here goes into the caliper and threads in through the back side and that part attaches to the hose right there. This side goes to the car's factory brake tube. Now the difference is you do have to worry about its position. Granted, they don't know where this car, granted they don't know where this caliper was gonna go, so it's kinda like a one size fits all, but not exactly. And you do have to pay attention if this doesn't rub anything or it can grind down. If you're not careful, this will rub the tire upon uh, one turn or the other. So you do have to recognize where this is gonna wind up. Now I'm surprised it's done this way, but this piece here, it just goes into the hole in the back of the caliper. There isn't a chamfer on the inside, like a like a fitting here. It just threads in. So I'm gonna put Teflon on it. That way it's not just the stainless to aluminum block. It has a little bit more of a seal to it. The other thing you have to worry about is the clock position of this piece. And uh, I had to get pretty vicious on the other one, which makes me nervous sometimes. 
I can't lie, I don't like how tight I had to put it, but I clocked it perfect. So I want to pointing this way. So I got to put a good amount of crap on it to get it to go exactly where I want it. There we go. So now what I'm going to do is thread this in here so it's loose. Put the collar up into the hose itself. But this way I can twist this back and forth so I can position it the way I want it. Now I think In fact, I'm going to put a little more snot on there, just a little bit. Perfect. So this I'm going to twist. Next one I'm going to do, I learned this from the other side. The tire just comes in here real close. So you want to zip tie this to the strut, but you don't want to put it direct to the strut and have this chafe. So I took this old fuel line, split it, and then we're going to put it down like so, so it keeps it away from the tire. I'll put one zip tie facing that way, the other zip tie facing this way. And we'll strap it like so. Release. Release. Press. Press. Release. Release. Press. Press. Release. Press. Press. Release. Release. Press. Press. Release. Release. Press. Press. Release. 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 